let's do a quick review of the previous session's uh, content. We had this idea of light shows wave particle duality. We also learned that matter, that is things with mass, also shows wave particle duality. And we went on from that to discuss de Bruyne's idea that the waves were probability waves and they had the property that if you square the shape of the wave it generates the probability function. And by wave the technical term we use is the wave function. We then went on to discuss this idea which seems slightly crazy from the perspective of a person. So we viewed the idea of can people show their wave nature and we turn to the idea of what's called wave effect. The wave effects are reflection, refraction, interference and diffraction. And basically, can people do those things? And the one we chose to focus on was diffraction. Diffraction is the spreading out of a wave when it moves through a gap. So when people walk through a gap, their wave nature means that that's equivalent to a wave moving through a gap, or as de Broglie would say, a probability wave moving through the gap. And the diffraction pattern leads us to the probability of locating the person on the other side of the gap. Now in the last post we discussed some of the reasons why this feels slightly absurd. However, we worked out the diffraction angles for the first diffraction minimum, and we discussed the fact that in reality, for a single slit diffraction pattern, you only see outwards to about maybe the fifth zero, the fifth diffraction zero. And what we discovered was that the diffraction angles, if this is correct, are stunningly small. And the reason for this was because basically Planck's constant is such a small number. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. You can assume that Planck's constant, h, is basically the constant that tells us how strong quantum effects are in our world. If Planck's constant is very small, then quantum effects are very small. We'll understand a little bit more about what that sentence means when we get towards the end of this post. Okay. We then looked at how we can overcome the fact that Planck's constant is so small in order to produce diffraction angles that are reasonable, that are practical, that you could potentially identify in a lab because we're sort of good enough to measure those angles with our eyes, to see those angles. And we chose 20 degrees and we said, OK, let's imagine we're trying to produce diffraction of around 20 degrees. What does this mean? Is there any way of doing this? Is there any way of overcoming the fact that Planck's constant is making this effect sublimely small? And it turned out that there is a way of doing that. We can overcome somewhat the small value of Planck's constant by using particles that are very, very low in mass. So we chose electrons. And they have to go through a gap which is very, very small. And we chose the, the space between atoms in a thin film of a solid. And this led to electron diffraction. And electron diffraction has since been shown to not only be correct, but has become an incredibly important tool for physicists. Okay, so let's move on now and look a little bit more at the implications of wave-particle duality. Now, there's a really important point that we've mentioned before, and I'll mention again, which is that we have to have the idea that whatever the object is that we're talking about, it has to be confined. The reason that that's important is because a confined object means that there are barriers there are walls through which the object cannot move or get over. So for a confined object, there must be a zero at the walls for the wave function. 
This means that only certain waves will fit. For example, if I had a space defined by my two walls here, this is one dimensional. I should point out that very often physicists will discuss an idea and if the idea is quite complicated we'll lower the dimensions. We'll talk about one dimension or two dimensions even though we're actually living in of course a three-dimensional world. Now the reason that we do this is not to try and make it more confusing. Thinking about things in one dimension sometimes feels a little bit strange when we're in a 3D world. It's to try and make the ideas simpler to see in our mind's eye. So imagine that there is an object which is confined between these two walls. Now, just for the ability to draw a wave, if I imagine that dotted line as the x-axis, one wave that is allowed is that. That is a wave that is allowed between those two walls. And the reason it's allowed, of course, is because it adds zeros at the ends. And that means that when I square it to get the probability function, it's going to be zero at the edges. And that's where the confining walls are. And that makes sense. However, a wave that is not allowed is this one. Now, obviously, I've taken the wave too far. I've taken the wave beyond the right hand side confining wall. But the point is, if I ignore that bit and just say that that's basically the wave that I'm using, that's not allowed. Because the problem is that although I have a zero on the left hand side, which is fine because when I square zero, I get zero. I do not have a zero on the right hand side. On the right hand side, the wave that is being used to describe the object has a non-zero value at the wall, or if you like, just inside the wall. And that means that when I square that function and I'm going to get the probability wave, it means that there is a non-zero probability that the right-hand wall here is not confining the particle, which means it's not a confined particle. So the main point about this is that only certain waves or wavelengths fit. Now, what does this mean for energy? Okay, let's consider a situation where the energy of a particle is basically kinetic energy. Now we know that kinetic energy is given by a half mv squared. And if I take this equation and I do something a little bit strange, uh, it's almost considered to be a math trick. I'm going to multiply and divide by m. Now I can do that because of course that's 1. Uh, and it does look weird, I admit, but I'm going to let that equal m squared v squared over 2m. And the mathematician within me is desperate to try and cancel one of those m's, but I'm not going to do that. I can say that's the same as mv all squared over 2m. And mv is momentum. P, the momentum, is mv. So this gives kinetic energy is p squared over 2m. Now de Broglie gave us a relationship for the momentum. According to de Broglie he said that the wavelength describing the object is given by h over p, p being the momentum, which means that I can then get rid of p in this equation. So the equation becomes that the kinetic energy, instead of p squared, that's h squared over lambda squared, h squared over 2m lambda squared. Now I need the wavelength. Now I know that for a confined particle, only certain wave values are allowed because they have to have zeros at the edges. Now just to the right here, I'm going to draw the first three allowed waves. And this means that I can write L is a half a wavelength. Because if I look at that and I imagine a whole wave with multiple repetitions, 
I can see that the red wave here is that part of it. And that is one half of a whole cycle. The second one I can write as the length is two half wavelengths. That would be one half there and the second half there, which of course makes one whole wavelength. But I'm going to leave it as two halves at the moment. And the third one, L is equal to three half wavelengths, which means that I can then write these waves. The first wavelength that's allowed between the confining walls is given by 2L, just by simple rearrangement. The second possible wavelength that's allowed is 2L over 2. The third one, 2L over 3. So I recognise a pattern here. If I divide the first one by 1, I have lambda 1 is 2L over 1, lambda 2 is 2L over 2, lambda 3 is over 3. So there's a pattern here of lambda n, which is the allowed wavelengths, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, etc., is going to equal 2L over n. So I can put 2L over n into the equation for kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy now becomes h squared over 2m. And instead of lambda squared, I can have 4l squared over n squared. And when a number is on the bottom, on the bottom, it goes up to the top. So the kinetic energy is equal to h squared over 8 ml squared multiplied by n squared. Now this equation is really important. It's an important equation because it's an equation for energy and of course forces and energy are incredibly important in physics. It's called a quantum energy equation. Now unlike normal energy equations that we meet in what's called macroscopic physics, that's kind of physics of the big world, this particular equation is unusual because it's not continuous. It has a bunch of values that are constants. There's an 8 and there's a h. It has a bunch of things in it that are potentially variable. m, I could be talking about different particles and they could have a different mass. And l, that's the physical size of the confining space. So a room could be bigger or smaller and that would change the value of l. So Theoretically, I guess, those things, m and l, they're var variables that can take any value you like. However, the point is n cannot. n can only take integer values. It's the number of half wavelengths that are fitting between the confining space. And this means, as we said before, there are lots and lots and lots of values that are not allowed. n is not allowed to have the value 1.5. So just like we said, for a confined particle, only certain wavelengths will fit, or only certain wavelengths are allowed. That follows through, that feeds through, to make it that there are only certain values of kinetic energy that are allowed. This equation basically tells us the values that are allowed for the kinetic energy. So we end up with the conclusion that not all values for kinetic energy are allowed. Only certain values are possible, i.e. Kinetic energy is quantized. Quantized means it comes in lumps and any possible value is not allowed. Now, just before we develop this idea, let's just talk for a moment about the concept of a quantized quantity. Quantized quantities can only take certain values. They are not continuous. Now, most physics students are aware of this, even though they may not think so. One of the most common quantized quantities is charge. 
Now, when we talk about electrostatics and we talk about objects having charge, and in particular, we talk about the idea that you might take two objects and rub them against each other, we say that charge transfers from the one object to the other. The classic experiment here is that you take a rod of plastic and you rub it with silk or fur, and you'll hear a crackling noise as you do this. And that's tiny, tiny, tiny sparks that are happening. And what is happening when you do this is electrons from the one object are transferring onto the other. And charge only comes in increments, in units if you like, of the electronic charge value. That's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 of a coulomb. That is the charge of an electron. It is also the charge of a proton, the electron being negative, of course, and the proton being positive. If I said a rod has a charge of 16 times 10 to the minus 19 of a coulomb, why? Then the answer would be very simple. It has lost 10 electrons. If it's lost 10 electrons, it's lost 10 minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 of a coulomb. That's 16 times 10 to the minus 19. If it's lost that amount of negative charge and it was overall initially neutral, it's now got a positive charge of that amount. But second question, a rod has a charge of 3.0 times 10 to the min minus 19 of a coulomb. Why? And the answer is, we don't know. That doesn't make sense. Because 3.0 times 10 to the minus 19, that's not an increment of 1.6. If you said 1.6 times 10 to the min minus 19, I would have said, OK, it's lost an electron. If you just said 3.2, that's 2 times 1.6. 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19, that would have mean he's lost two electrons. But 3.0 doesn't work. When you have charge only coming in increments of 1.6, I can't get 3.0. That doesn't work. Charge can only be in integer values. I can get 1, 1 1.6, or 2, 1 1.6s, 3.2, or 3, 1.6s, 4.8. I can't get 3.0. So charge is a quantized quantity. It comes in certain values and lots of other values, therefore, are not allowed. Now, energy, as we've just seen, like charge, is a quantized quantity. It only has certain allowed values. The difference between energy and charge is that charge can only come in increments of the electronic charge. I'm ignoring, by the way, the idea of quarks, which can have fractional charge. So we're just ignoring the concept that, that quarks exist at the moment. Charge can come in increments of 1.6. Energy comes in increments. But unlike charge, the, the allowed values for energy depend on the size, the physical size of the confining space and also the mass of the object. If we look at the equation here, we have that kinetic energy is h squared over 8 ml squared times n squared, which means that the increments, the differences between one allowed value of kinetic energy and the next also depend on the mass and the physical size L. So unlike charge, energy comes in values that are partly due to the mass of the object, whatever the object is, and the physical size of the confining space. OK, so let's just have a look at what this means for the example that we had in the past, which was to discuss an oxygen molecule. If you imagine that we have a lab and we have an imaginary one dimensional line and an oxygen molecule is bouncing between the two ends.
Now, there are no forces interacting on it uh, if this was uh, uh, an ideal gas, except when it hits the walls. In this picture, I'm representing the oxygen molecule as a particle. I am not describing it as a wave. What I would like to do is write down the kinetic energy equation for the oxygen molecule. So we have kinetic energy is h squared over 8 ml squared. This is the quantum energy equation for the particle multiplied by, of course, n squared. Now, n can only take integer values. So the first thing I would point out is n cannot equal 0. And the reason that this is clear is seen when you consider the wavelength, the link between the wavelength and n. So you recall at the side here that lambda n is 2L over n. If n was 0, then the wavelength that would be used to describe this oxygen molecule would be 2L over 0, which would be infinity. A very, 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 very large wavelength. And that won't fit. A very large wavelength will not fit in the confining space. So n cannot be 0. There is a minimum possible energy for the oxygen molecule, and it's not allowed to be zero. Now, this is very different to classical physics. So if we just draw that comparison very briefly as a note, in classical physics, we have an equation for kinetic energy. And it is that the average kinetic energy of the particles in a system is given by 3 over 2 kT, which means that at absolute zero, the kinetic energy will be zero. Kinetic energy values cannot be less than zero. Kinetic energy is a scalar quantity. To be lower than zero would mean you would have to be a negative number. Kinetic energies cannot be less than zero. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with motion and you can't have less motion than no motion. So if the average kinetic energy is zero when the temperature is zero, then that must mean that all of the particles are stationary. And this is the classical way that we understand the concept of absolute zero. At absolute zero, that is a temperature of zero Kelvin, all of the particles in a system are stationary. Quantum physics does not say that. Quantum physics says that at the temperature zero Kelvin, we have basically the minimum amount of kinetic energy, but it does not, importantly, equal zero. The particles will still be moving. And let's try and work out the absolute minimum possible kinetic energy that it can have. Question, what is the value for Ke min, the lowest possible kinetic energy for an oxygen molecule in an 8 meter wide lab. Okay, so we need a few things. We've got this idea that the confining space that the oxygen molecule is within is 8 meters across. A reasonably big lab. Again, we're only considering one-dimensional motion. We'll expand to three dimensions later. The kinetic energy is h squared over 8 ml squared times by n squared. Now, we know that L is 8. We need the mass of the object. It's an oxygen molecule. So we need the mass of an oxygen molecule. I'm going to assume that we're talking about the most abundant isotope of oxygen, which is oxygen-16. Which means that an O2 molecule, two oxygen atoms, has a mass of two sixteens, 32 atomic mass units. And an atomic mass unit is 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27. 
5.3 times 10 to the minus 26 of a kilogram. So we can say that the minimum possible value for the kinetic energy is when n equals 1. So let's stop writing the word min and just for a little bit more conciseness we'll call it kinetic energy 1 which means when n equals 1 the lowest possible value for n that will be 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 squared that is going to be a very small number divided by 8 times by 5.3 times 10 to the minus 26 times by 8 squared which is 64 multiplied by 1 for the n value even though it's squared of course 1 times 1 is 1 and I make that 1.6 times 10 to the minus 44 of a joule. That is a very small amount of kinetic energy. But is it really very small? In physics it's really useful to ask yourself a question every time you get a numerical answer. And the question is, does this number make sense? Now, when you first try using this technique to try and help you in physics, i.e., does this number make sense? For most people, there are only three options, yes, no, or I don't know. And I don't know is their answer. But as time goes on, and you get more and more experience of the numbers that are used in physics, you start to say more and more yes or no rather than I don't know. Now one way to help you is to take a number and if you don't know whether it makes sense, turn it into something else. Convert it to some other number that might make sense. So we have the minimum possible kinetic energy for an oxygen molecule in an 8 by 8 by 8 let's say cubic room and I'm only considering it moving between one wall and the opposite wall. We have a value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 44 of a joule. So let's ask the question, does this make sense? And the answer is, not sure. Seems pretty small. That makes me feel that, mm, okay, that's reasonable. But I don't know whether, again, this kinetic energy is large or not. So let's convert it. Let's assume that that value we can turn into a speed. So kinetic energy is for the oxygen molecule a half mv squared and I've just worked out that value as 1.6 times 10 to the minus 44 so that means that the speed will be equal to 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 44 over the mass of the oxygen molecule 5.3 times 10 to the minus 26 square rooted and that gives me 7.8 times 10 to the minus 10 meters per second so does that number make sense okay well I'm not sure if, again feels pretty small the size of an atom is around an angstrom which is 10 to the minus 10 so this is maybe um, three, four, five atoms in size. So it will cover three, four, five atoms per second. Uh, so I think that's very small. Could I imagine that that is zero? Could I imagine that like the classical idea, I might imagine that if I tried to measure this, it would look like the oxygen molecule is actually stationary. Well, I, I think the answer to that is probably yes. But let's try and reconvert it into a different way. Let's ask a different question. Let's ask, what would be the time taken to travel one centimetre? How would we do that? Well, speed is distance over time, which means that the time is the distance over the speed. So the distance that I'm talking about is a centimetre. 
1 times 10 to the minus 2 of a metre. Let's always remember that we need to stick to SI units. Divided by the speed, and I've just worked out the speed as 7.8 times 10 to the minus 10. 1.3 times 10 to the 7 seconds. 149 days. So what we're saying is, if I could see the oxygen molecule, which of course I can't, but if I could see the oxygen molecule and it was kind of right in front of my eyes and I could make a note of where it is and then I went away and I kept coming back repeatedly looking at where it is and I'm looking to see how long it takes to move one centimetre. I'd have to wait 149 days. So I think if I came back after a few days or maybe a few weeks and it still doesn't look like it's moved, then yeah, okay, I can imagine that this would look stationary to a human being. So I'm left once again with the fact that since this would look stationary to a person, once again, a, a quantum mechanical effect, i.e. at absolute zero, it's not stationary, it's moving. A quantum mechanical effect would look like I expect it to be using classical physics. It looks like it is stationary. So it's clearly very difficult, it seems, to be able to measure quantum mechanical effects. And our best chance, of course, is to try and reduce the energy, which means make the measurements at very low temperatures. At room temperature, it's difficult to see quantum mechanical effects. Now, that's a statement that most people think is correct. It actually isn't correct. It's rubbish. And in future posts, we're going to show how there are plenty of quantum mechanical effects around you that are very obvious. And what I mean by that is there's an effect. If we try to explain it, we have to use quantum mechanical uh, ideas to explain it. But let's put that to the side because it's not really of interest in this particular post. Now, the final thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the three dimensional version of this. Imagine now that we move from 1D to 3D. We imagine that we're in a cube. Basically, we imagine that the particle is in a confining space that's cubic. So we have L, L, L. And when we look at the kinetic energy in three dimensions of our particle moving, then we have the kinetic energy associated with its x motion plus the kinetic energy associated with its y motion, plus the kinetic energy associated with its z motion. Now, when we add these up, we simply add them up. We don't add them up using vectors. Energy is not a vector quantity. So the total kinetic energy in three dimensions is going to be h squared over 8 ml squared times nx squared plus h squared over 8 ml squared times n y squared plus h squared over 8 ml squared times n z squared. Now, if it wasn't a cube and I had x, y, and z, then I'd have an x there, a y there, and a z there. The only reason that I've chosen a cube is just to keep things simple, that's all. So I can simplify this equation by saying that in three dimensions, the kinetic energy of an object can be written as h squared over 8 ml squared into nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared. And we're in a situation now, once again, where the lowest possible energy is not zero. We have the rule that n can only be integer values and it cannot be zero. So nx, ny, and nz can equal 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And they're not allowed to be zero. The values are not allowed to be negative. In part, that wouldn't make a great deal of difference because when I square them, I'll get the same answer as if I'd assumed it was a positive number. But if you remember where the ends came from, 
the ends came from the number of half wavelengths that are fitting within the confining space. And so the idea that I had n equals minus 1, so I had minus 1 of a half wavelength, doesn't really make sense when I say it. Okay, so the minimum possible value, and I'm still using 1, but now I mean 1, the lowest possible value. This would be h squared over 8 ml squared into 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. 3 h squared over 8 ml squared. That is the lowest possible energy. And another quick note, the lowest possible energy is often referred to as the ground state. Now we can use this equation and look at all the other possible energies that are allowed. And we're going to do that in the next post. And that will lead us to a concept called degeneracy. But at this point, I think we'll draw a close to this now. We'll leave this idea that particles can be described using wave-particle duality, where the particle has a wave nature. And when we talk about that wave nature, it is fundamentally coming from a description of how we identify the location of it. It generates a probability wave. And this idea has already now led to a very strange result. Beyond the fact that the probability functions are strange in themselves, as we saw in the previous post, it has generated the idea that there is a thing called the ground state, the lowest possible energy that the particle can have. And at absolute zero, that lowest possible energy is not zero. Unlike the classical prediction of at absolute zero, the energy is zero, everything is stationary, Quantum mechanics tells us that at absolute zero, everything has its lowest possible energy, but not zero. Zero is not allowed. And I will finish on the fundamental point there, that if zero energy were allowed, this would mean that the wavelength that describes the object is infinite in extent. And therefore, it cannot be a confined particle. So if someone asks the question, is it possible, using quantum mechanics, for an object to have zero energy? Then reconstructing that question is like saying, is it possible in quantum mechanics for something to have an infinite wavelength as the wave that's describing it? And the answer is yes, as long as the object is not confined. If the object is in infinite, empty space, then that's possible. However, the reality is, that's not really viable. So for all the kind of materials that we would ever wish to consider, quantum mechanics is a very real effect. We do not have access to an infinite space. So the minimum possible energy for any object is not zero. It is whatever the value the ground state is. And remember, the ground state in this particular example where we're talking about kinetic energy the ground state depends on the mass of the object and the physical size of the confining space. So, until next time, take care, be happy.